This is a podcast from the Business Times. Welcome to Wealth with BT, hosted by Genevieve Kwa. In this episode, we explore the benefits of investing in private markets. This episode is brought to you by Pictet Wealth Management. Interest in private markets today is as high as it has ever been. This is especially since 2022, when the rapid rise in interest rates and inflation caused stocks and bonds to fall at the same time. We don't need to look very far for institutions which invest in private markets. Recently, Tamasek disclosed its annual performance. It has achieved a total shareholder return of 7% a year over the past 20 years. Its unlisted portfolio is very substantial, at more than half of its total portfolio, and includes private equity, credit, and early-stage companies. Of course, Tamasic has a very different mandate than individuals or even family offices. Anecdotally, based on my conversations with advisors, the typical allocation into alternative assets for wealthy individuals is less than 10%. But this is said to be growing, especially among families who aspire to build multi-generational wealth. What's the attraction of private market assets? What's the outlook for these investments? Should you make an allocation? Welcome to Wealth with BT. I'm Genevieve Kwa, your podcast host and wealth editor of The Business Times. We have a guest, Victor Erni, equity partner of the Pictet Group, who is with us to share insights about why private markets may be worth a deeper look. Welcome to Wealth with BT, Victor. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Victor was appointed Chief Executive of Pictet Wealth Management Asia last year. Before joining Pictet, Victor was with the Boston Consulting Group, where he became partner at age 31. So, Victor, please tell us. What is driving interest in private markets and what benefits do they bring to investors? Thank you very much, Genevieve, for the introduction. I'll try to elaborate on this quite vast topic today. And uh, let's start with your question. So private assets have become steadily more mainstream over the past few years, with assets under management growing by double digits each year. Private equity still accounts for the largest share of the private asset universe. And the private real estate market is also pretty mature. But private debt and infrastructure have been catching up in terms of attracting investor interest. A key driver for this growth has been investor search for diversification and higher uncorrelated returns over the long term. Private assets offer diversified returns that are less correlated with the performance of traditional bond and equity investments, meaning that they can mitigate risks in an investment portfolio. There are several reasons for this. The first one is sector allocation. Private equity managers generally target investments in growing areas and or companies whose performance can be substantially improved since they focus on innovative, promising companies that may choose to remain private for longer, private asset managers benefit from these companies' growth before they become public. It is worth remembering that the number of publicly traded companies in the US has shrunk by over 50% since the mid-1990s. This means that investors have to explore new avenues to diversify their portfolios. The second factor behind private assets' uncorrelated returns is the ability of private asset managers to time their exit from an investment so as to maximize its value. Third, control over investments is a key part of the private asset equation. The point of a private equity fund is to have a material impact on the way a company is managed in order to make it more efficient. But for private investment to work, there needs to be an alignment of interests between all parties involved, the fund manager, investors, and companies' management. 
Thanks, Victor. I think you brought up some really good points, like companies staying private for longer and fewer and fewer listed companies. Market conditions, however, have somewhat shifted since 2022. So, what challenges and opportunities do you see in today's environment for private assets? And how are you guiding investors' expectations for the near and longer term? So, despite its historical success, private equity and private investing more generally has been facing challenges from the hike in interest rates. The increased cost of capital and the widening gap between buyer and seller prices has led to a drastic reduction in the investment to exit ratio of US private equity. Put simply, private equity funds have faced growing difficulties in selling on companies. These funds are having to hold on to assets longer than they would want to. This has been forcing them to make sometimes substantial concessions, particularly to sell lower quality assets. We therefore think that vintages, the first year of a private investment, from the years 2018 to 2021, when asset prices were high, could prove disappointing. Yet private investing has evolved significantly over the past decade, and we think it will continue to grow into the future despite all these challenges. We think that we are moving out of an old area of private equity investing that relied heavily on cheap leverage when rates were low and on economic growth to push earnings multiple higher. Now we are in a new area. There is greater discipline about taking on too much leverage and caution about the risk of overpaying for target companies among private equity managers, for example. There is also much greater focus in the market on finding private equity managers who have proven capacity to add operating value to the companies they invest in, especially as the economic challenges continue to grow. The pipeline of IPOs is beginning to fill again, increasing the opportunity to exit existing investments. Helped by a drop in interest rates, The sheer backlog that has built should ensure that more takeover deals are done at attractive valuations this year and that distributions to investors will continue to pick up. And new investment prospects will also appear as interest rates continue to decline. Thus, we believe 2022, 2023 and 2024 vintages are likely to outperform. The same ideas hold true for private real estate. These undoubtedly remain challenging times for property investors, with a big decline in commercial real estate transactions and steep decline in valuations. Yet the annual rental income produced by quality real estate assets in prime locations continues to rise. Limited supply and strong demand is also helping certain segments, notably logistics centers, or data centers. In short, the current downturn in private real estate disguises significant dispersion. Over the past year and more, private credit has been showing its resilience in the face of inflation and rising interest rates. Opportunities exist in distressed and stressed debt, for example. Direct lending, which has a lower loss than high yield, or leveraged loans due to rigorous asset selection and high recovery rates should also continue to grow and outperform. We've just been chatting with Victor Erni of Picte Wealth Management Asia. Among the largest and most successful investors in private markets are endowment funds, which have been early investors and achieved great long-term returns. What is the endowment approach to investing in private markets? We'll hear more about this after the break. And now back to Wealth with BT, brought to you by Pictet Wealth Management. Welcome back to Wealth with BT. Victor has just given us a good bird's eye view of the market challenges for private market assets, where it seems there will be a silver lining for more recent vintages. But when it comes to investing in private assets, endowment funds are often held up as models of long-term success. One of the most famous is the Yale University, whose endowment was managed by the late David Swenson. 
Victor, what insights can we draw from how endowments invest in private markets and how might this approach be adopted by private clients? So let's go back first a little bit in history. David Swenson took charge of the Yale Endowment Fund in 1985, after which the fund's allocation shifted increasingly from traditional investments to alternatives to produce what is known as the Yale model. This involves low allocations to things like fixed income and big allocations to alternative, often illiquid investments like hedge funds, private equity, venture capital and real estate. Over the past two decades, the latter three in particular have become dominant as Yale's endowment fund has pursued higher long-term returns. The Yale endowment model has been copied by other large university endowment funds in the US. Since these funds have a long-term horizon, these funds are capable of withstanding short-term volatility. That's really the key point. The success of endowment funds cannot be denied. According to a study by NACUBO, large endowment funds in the US have produced an average annual return of over 9% over the past decade. Although that figure may drop, we believe the endowment style of investing still retains its potential and holds important lessons for private clients as well, particularly the importance of being able to tolerate significant short-term volatility in pursuit of superior long-term returns. This involves making significant investments in alternative investments, including private assets, at the expense of more liquid instruments like stocks or bonds. The kind of investor who could typically benefit from an endowment style approach includes ultra high net worth individuals, foundations, and family offices. They can really think in decades. But the word of caution investors need to exercise sound judgment and need to be comfortable with the illiquidity of private investments. So let's take the conversation down to individuals. And you've mentioned this as well, that you need to be ready for the illiquidity. So where do private assets sit in a portfolio and and how much is enough? Indeed, one needs to be aware that private assets are not suitable for all investors and are meant for more sophisticated investors who can afford to hold illiquid assets. The key thing a private investor needs to know is that although private assets have plenty of potential benefits, they can't be bought and sold easily like shares, hence the term illiquidity. They come with different risk factors from publicly traded stocks and bonds and are less liquid and have longer term horizons. They are truly long term investments and come with their own risks. To answer your question more precisely, it takes time to build private asset portfolios and investors need to hold these assets for a number of years to extract their potential value. Given the recent challenges, the ideal period for private equity investments is probably tilting more towards five years or even eight years rather than three years, allowing fund managers more time to add operational value to their holdings. So what do you see actually as the biggest risks that investors should be mindful of? Because it sounds like the challenge of, you know, actually researching fund managers, for example, clients probably need a lot of professional advice. What are your thoughts on this? Due to their unique characteristics, investors need to have quite sophisticated knowledge before considering private assets. That is why investors need a trusted partner. There are two crucial things to remember in private investing. First, returns are usually reported on a quarterly basis, unlike listed markets, which usually trade every day. Second, investors have to commit for a set period of time, usually up to 10 years, depending on the fund. This is quite different from an investment in public markets, which can be held over the time horizon of the investor's choosing, so from one day to eternal. And tight cash flow management is essential in private investing as there is generally a lag between an investor's initial commitment and the actual investment. Investors must have significant scope to commit capital and meet periodic funding calls for private assets over the long term. They need to be able to tolerate short-term drawdowns 
resist crisis behavior and stick to a rigorous spending policy. These investors must understand that, unlike with savings, only a portion of their invested capital can be spent each year. So focus needs to be on the long-term rather than short-term returns. These investors will benefit from finding a wealth manager with experience of serving like-minded clients and taking a longer-term approach. It is vital for them to select the right partners, once aligned with their own mindset. Thank you, Victor, for dropping in and spending some time with us. That's a lot to think about. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Among financial advisors, investing in private markets is seen to be an important aspect of diversifying a portfolio. We've all seen how stocks and bonds can fail us at the same time in times of crisis. Private assets are also an opportunity to participate in emerging themes in areas like healthcare or technology, which can prove to be very rewarding. There are, of course, many caveats. Illiquidity, as we've heard, is one thing, and there's also less transparency on private companies. And you will need to make sure you can stay invested for the long term. We've just heard that this could be in decades. I hope this episode has given you food for thought. Until the next episode, thank you for listening. This episode of Wealth with BT was brought to you by Pictay Wealth Management. This is a podcast by The Business Times. Find more BT podcasts at businesstimes.com.sg slash podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is meant to provide general information only. SPH Media accepts no liability for loss arising from any reliance on the podcast or use of third parties products and services. Please consult professional advisors for independent advice.